right, good morning. Um, well, I think that's my last slide. It's not my... So I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, today about some of the stuff that I work on, and um, specifically some of the products. I know it's always tough as an algae guy when I come to these uh, meetings where there probably aren't too many other algologists, phycologists in the audience, right? Um, so I'll try to keep it at a pretty high level for the first half, but then, I, you know, as, as I like to say, I, I need to establish some street creds, so I will show you some actual gels and things at the end, but I'll, I'll try not to get into too much detail then. Okay? But what I really want to tell you about today is something that's going to impact all of us uh, very soon. I, actually, it's already impacting us now, uh, specifically here in Canada, but, but throughout the world. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. And that is that food and fuel are, are really the same thing. All right? And although uh, all, all of us know what the price of oil has gone to, uh, all, all of us know about the conflicts in the Middle East, but what I think a lot of people really haven't recognized is how much this is driven um, by energy and, and really by, by food. So why do we think about these two things together? And why am I going to tell you about these two things together? At, at the simplest level, both are chemical energy. That is the energy in a substance that can be released by a chemical reaction to do work. So in other words, you know, I, I can eat a pizza and I can ride my bike, or I can put a gallon of gas in my car and I can drive my, bike, uh, drive, drive my car that same distance, right? So in some ways, they're both really the same thing. And in fact, as many of you know, we spend a fair amount of our food and convert it into transportation fuels. In the United States now, do we have a laser on here? Which one is it? That one? Aha. So in the United States, we, we take about 40% of our corn crop and we turn that into ethanol and we blend that for about 5%, 7% of our transportation fuel. So we directly convert food into fuel. And in fact, I think you can probably do the opposite too, which is you can take fuel and turn it into food, and I'll show you a little bit about the way we do that. Sometimes I think we do it directly. I think that's what Twinkies are. I think they're actually a petroleum product. But, but we also do it indirectly, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But more to the point is that food and fuel are actually both the biological conversion of sunlight energy into chemical energy. And that is brought about by photosynthesis, right? So photosynthesis is the most wonderful reaction on the planet, all right? What it does is it takes sunlight and CO2 and it converts that first into sugars and releases oxygen that we breathe, and those sugars quickly get converted into carbohydrates and proteins and lipids, which we all recognize as food, but those are also all of our fuel. Petroleum, all of our petroleum is simply fossil algae. It's simply ancient algae. And all of coal is simply ancient plants. So all of these, all of the fossil fuels that we use are simply Fossil photosynthate. That is the products of photosynthesis. All right? So, in many senses, it's what we do. It's what we are. It's what we eat. It's our transportation fuel. It's everything. But we can put that in, in economic terms as well. And this slide right here, really, if you haven't looked at energy, and when I first started looking at this five or six years ago, was alarming. So, first of all, energy by itself is the largest industry in the world, bar none. $5.8 trillion, all right? But as I said, since food and fuel are really the same thing, if you add in agriculture and you add in chemicals, you are now at 70% of the economy of the planet comes from photosynthesis, all right? As, as Phil Sharp pointed out yesterday, you know, since all of this comes from photosynthesis, that's 70% of what we do, and as he pointed out, the actual funding into agriculture, into photosynthesis, he said was one thirtieth of, of medical. You know, I think the funding into algae is probably one one hundredth of that into plant biology. So if you look at it in those terms, it's amazing that 70% of our economic activity is probably the least funded research that we do on the planet. Okay? So why, 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 is, why is food you know, why is it so underfunded? It's underfunded because, to a degree, we're a victim of our own success. Agricultural science, started in the Green Revolution 50 years ago, drove agricultural productivity to unprecedented rates, right? That's why we can have 7 billion people on the planet now. But we did this at an enormous cost, and that's shown right here. So if you look at the number of people who work on farms, or if you look at the, number, uh, the, the amount of land that we use in agriculture, it didn't increase a bit in the last 50 years. 
all right? What increased enormously was productivity, and that productivity was driven by mechanization, huge increase in tractors, a huge increase in the amount of fertilizer, and a huge increase of energy input in. So in other words, we took petroleum, we took energy, mechanized agriculture, and that gave us this enormous productivity increase. So why is that a problem? That's a problem because we didn't do it in the most efficient way. All right? Agriculture, although it's enormously efficient from the sense of how many people work on it, it's very inefficient in terms of how much energy we put into it. And so why is that really coming to the surface now is shown on, on this slide, I think, pretty well. So what this is is a plot of petroleum production over the last 10,000 years. Here we are right here now, 2012. We're right at the peak of that. The reason I picked 10,000 years and you could pick many different numbers. You could pick 300 million years, which is how long it took us to accumulate that petroleum. That's how long algae was growing and settling to the bottom of the seas and being buried over. And so 300 million years of petroleum, we're going to burn through in less than 200 million years. I could have picked 500,000 years, which is how long people have been on the planet in one form or another, right? Maybe a million, right? But if I had picked either one of those, that little line right there would become so small that you couldn't even see it. So what that tells you is we are going to burn through 300 million years of energy reserve on this planet in about eight generations of human beings. This slide, I think, sums up what the real issue is, though, and why this is going to be a concern to everyone in this audience. So this is that exact same plot. Here's the blue line, petroleum utilization. And overlaid on top of that is human population. And I think this slide, more than any other, really shows you what the Green Revolution did. It allowed us to turn huge amounts of energy into large numbers of people, seven billion people on this planet now. So the problem really is, and the issue that we're gonna have to face is, how, if that blue line is gonna drop back down, what happens to that red line? How are we going to keep 7 billion people alive on the planet? And that number is projected to go to 9 billion people. How are we going to keep them alive? But more important, it's not just how are we going to keep them alive. How are we going to allow them to live the lifestyle that they want to live, right? Because the world is flat now, meaning that everyone on the planet knows exactly the way we live, right? Everyone sees the houses that we have in the States and here in Canada and the cars and the clothes that we wear and the very nice lifestyle, and they want to have that too, right? So there are two and a half billion people in China and India, and they want to have the same lifestyle that we do, and the way they get the same lifestyle that we do, they consume the same amount of energy that we do. So there is enormous pressure on energy reserves. So many people say, well, okay, that, that graph of peak oil isn't real. We're never going to run out of fossil fuel. We'll always go find more. And that is true to a degree, right? But what we've run out of is cheap fuel. And how do I know that? Well, here's a picture of the Canadian tar sands. I know, that they're, I know that's politically incorrect. They're called oil sands here now, all right? But, but, but the Canadian tar sands, and there's a reason we say that, okay? So what you really have to look at is what's your energy return on investment, right? Your EROI, okay? And what that tells you is how much it costs to get that out of the ground. And what that really tells you is how much is that energy going to cost when you sell it? What are you going to have to pay for it? So in Saudi Arabia in West Tex and West Texas, where we pulled lots of petroleum out of the ground, our return on investment of that was about 100 to 1. That meant it took one barrel of oil, you got 100 barrels of oil back out. So 100 to 1 return on your investment. The Canadian tar sands are less than 4 to 1. And in fact, you know, in the United States now, there's been an entire campaign that we can be energy independent in the next eight years because of what's called the Balkan shale oil, or tide oil, people call it, okay? and, and a process called fracking. The energy return on investment of that is less than three to one. Canadian tar sands are about $85 a barrel to get out of the ground and ship. Fracked tide oil is about $110 a barrel. So we have large reserves here, 165 billion barrels in Canada, 750 billion barrels in, in the shale oil, so we can go on for another 100 years with these things, but we can only do it if we're willing to spend 125 
for $135 a barrel, all right? So that doesn't really impact us in, in the first world. I mean, okay, listen, the price of gas is gonna go up, right? But in the States right now, we're at about four bucks a gallon. So let's say it goes to $8 a gallon, great. I take my car that gets 23 miles a gallon and I swap it in for a Prius that gets 50 and my out-of-pocket expense is the same, right? I complain a little bit about it, but I'm still just fine. So who does this really impact? Who this really impacts is if the price of food doubles, and I'll show you a little bit of evidence that it is, right? If the price of food doubles, there are two and a half billion people on this planet who spend 50% of their income on food. There are one billion people on this planet who spend 70% of their income on food. So I think you can do the quick math there and figure out that if the price of food doubles, there's two and a half billion people on this planet that are in serious trouble. Now, I said we we're already seeing the repercussions of this. This is what some people are calling the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring didn't start out as a movement for democracy. It morphed into that. It started out as food riots. It started out as riots because in Egypt, they could no longer subsidize bread, and the same in Tunisia. And so as they stopped subsidizing bread and the price of food went up, people began to starve. People, people were hungry. And so they blamed their governments and they brought them down and they said, oh, this must be our corrupt governments are doing this. And unfortunately, although I think it's wonderful that democracy is coming to this part of the world, this is not going to impact their cost of food one bit. All right? So why is it that the price of food is going to go up so dramatically? It used to be, for many years, we produced fossil fuel for just about nothing. Eight bucks a barrel. In fact, if you go over the last... 20 years even, the price averaged less than $20 a barrel. And at $20 a barrel, that's a small enough input into agriculture that it, didn't, that it wasn't the dominant economic force driving the cost of it. But as the price of energy goes up, it becomes more significant, right? And in fact, since 2005, the price of food, and this is simply plotting, plotting the price of corn, and the price of oil have been directly correlated. So every time oil goes up, there's a bit of a lag, but then food follows right up again. Now you can have spikes, like this one right here, where the price of food goes up because there was some environmental damage to the crop, and that, that increased. And that's what we've seen actually this last year in the United States in the drought in corn. Corn is $7.50 a bushel today. Historic levels for corn are about $4 a bushel. $5 corn is good for the farmers. In fact, there's an expression, $5 corn. Right, that means you're doing pretty good. At 750, that's great for farmers. That is not such a good thing for the rest of the planet. Okay, so that's the problem. But now what I want to tell you a little bit about is, is you know, why on earth would we think about algae to impact any of this stuff, energy or food, right? So why algae is a, is a bioenergy platform? Well, first of all, there's a couple things you have to think about. Probably number one is scalability, all right? If you don't have a process that can scale to meet the amount of energy we consume right now, it doesn't make that much difference how successful it is, right? We burn 1.2 trillion gallons of petroleum every year, 300 billion gallons in the United States. So if you don't have something that can produce hundreds of billions of gallons of fuel per year, you haven't really made a difference. The second thing is, if we really want to think about doing this biologically, we have to have productivities that are enormous, right? We can't take all of our agricultural land and turn that into making fuel, right? 40% of our corn crop only produces 13 billion gallons of ethanol, right? So that's about 10 billion gallon equivalents of fuel, and we burn 300 billion. So as you can see, we're not gonna get there with corn. Then obviously we wanna be sustainable Right? We have to do this for a very long time. At least I, I'm, I, I won't be around that much longer, but you know, I'm, I'm counting on my kids to still have the lifestyle and my grandkids to have the lifestyle that I've had. And that means this has to go on for hundreds of years. And then the last thing I want to talk about, just to end it up, is the diversity of algae and why I think that can really be important for other things that we want to do in addition to bioenergy. So when we talk about productivity, there's two ways to measure that. The easiest way is simply chemical energy, which is biomass, tons per acre per year, and algae can be enormously productive, more productive than any terrestrial crop. There's no magic about that. It's not that photosynthesis in algae 
is hugely more efficient than it is in any other system. The reason that you drive these productivities is because you can increase the concentration of CO2 in water. And believe it or not, CO2 for photosynthesis is a limiting resource. So because you can dramatically increase that concentration in water, you can dramatically drive photosynthetic efficiencies. But the other thing algae does is it accumulates naturally oils. That's why petroleum is algae. It naturally accumulated those things. So how does the process work? Well, you grow algae up. These are pictures from my lab. I'll show you one at the very end of what it looks like at scale. It doesn't quite look like this. But you grow the algae up. You concentrate it. You separate the oil from the proteins and the rest of the carbohydrates. You concentrate that oil. And then the crude oil can go directly into existing refineries and produce drop-in transportation fuels. Some people, they were surprised by that. The oil companies weren't. The oil companies knew what petroleum is. It's not ancient melted dinosaurs, it's algae. So the fact that we get oil today that looks just like the stuff that's been around is no surprise. And in fact, a company that I'm a founder of called Sapphire Energy, but other of our competitors, have taken oil from algae and turned it into to jet fuel, and we've flown jet aircraft on it. We also have a little car called the Algeus, not Algesus, Algeus. And, that, and that's, a, that, that's a little hybrid car that we drove from uh, San Francisco to Washington, D.C. on a diesel engine with diesel algae uh, fuel. And then we, we put a gasoline engine in and drove it back to San Diego on gasoline made from algae oil. And that car now sits down in the parking lot of Sapphire and occasionally comes out. One of our competitors, Solazyme, actually produced 250,000 gallons of biodiesel. And the U.S. Navy this summer used it to fly their jets to drive their amphibious vehicles, right? So we know it works. And in fact, algae biodiesel is now sold in San Francisco. There are four gas stations that you can go into and you can get a 20% blend that's 20% algae and 80% petroleum sold by Solazine, okay? So that process already works. So, I think it's thinking. Can you advance the slide for me? Ah, thanks. Okay, so the process already works. So there's no new biology that we have to do. What we have to do is we have to drive the economics of that. You know, we, we did an estimation of this in 2009. In 2009, we, we sort of calculated that fuel made from algae would be something around 20 to $21 a gallon, something in that range. And we said that just by bioprospecting alone, in other words, by going out and finding better strains of algae, we think we can reduce that down to six or eight bucks a gallon in the next four or five years, right? And in fact, that's exactly the number we've come down to right now. In 2012, the estimates are from Sapphire and from Solazyme that they're down around eight dollars a gallon for their production fuel, right? So obviously that's still not competitive with fossil fuel. They're the cheapest thing on the planet. We complain about it at four bucks a gallon, but four bucks a gallon is 60 cents a pound. Literally, the only thing cheaper on the planet is dirt, right? Food is more expensive than that. Everything is more expensive. So in 2009, the cost of petroleum was going up at this rate, right? And what really matters is when does the cost of petroleum cross over with the cost of bioenergy? At that point, we will start to utilize it. And then we estimated that, well, sometime around 2017 or 2018. But then we also said, yes, but... We saw a spike in oil, and a lot of people said, oh, that was in, in 2007, that was because the economy went crazy, and that we're, that's never going to happen again. But we sort of looked at the numbers, and we said, no, we don't think that's true. We think the cost of petroleum is going to continue to go up, and that's this plot right here. And in fact, here we are in 2012, and you can see in 2012, we said it would be about $4 a gallon. In California, it spiked up to about $4.50. It's sitting right about $4 a gallon now. So, so this is apparently the line of increase. And that means we're going to cross over with those things sometimes in the next four or five years. So we still have to drive efficiencies on this. We still have to go to scale. I'll show you a little bit about that. But by and large, we are on the path to achieve bioenergy from algae. Okay? But we have to do a few more things to get that to go. Could you advance that? Thanks. So what I want to tell you about now for the remainder of the time is why do we think about algae as a biotechnology platform? And really for this group, biotechnology platform is probably much more important than a biofuel platform. A biofuel platform requires enormous scale and very cheap prices to reach. And it's now an engineering problem more than it's a biological problem. But there are enormous opportunities on the bioproduct side inside of algae 
And those are some that I want to show you just a little bit about now and what we've done in my lab to address some of those. Obviously, there are a number of things that are already made from, from algae. Nutraceuticals, you know, both carotenoids and beta carotenes and astaxanthin, all of those are commercially sold, about $8 billion worldwide. Clearly, we have an enormous opportunity on the protein side of things. First and foremost, in food and animal feed, and companies are already starting to develop these things, especially in the aquaculture industry as a replacement for fish as, we've as we have depleted our fish supplies. But as I'll show you, we can also use these things for therapeutic proteins and for a few other novel. So as I said at, at one point, I, I think the enormous opportunity in algae is really sort of twofold. One is its photosynthetic platform, and it's a microorganism, which means we can do things really quick in it. Okay? And we're using all of our energy inputs are coming from sunlight. So this will be the most efficient system available for production of any bioproduct. All of the stuff we do in bacteria or yeast by fermentation, what we're really doing is doing photosynthesis someplace else, storing that energy as sugar, transporting it to a location, and then feeding that sugar to the microorganisms to make the bioproduct. In the case of algae, we're just going to go directly sunlight to bioproduct. But the other thing that I think people haven't recognized, or maybe you're just starting to recognize, is the enormous genetic, sorry, the enormous genetic diversity. Some people estimate that there are three million species of algae in the environment. At least 10 times or 15 times as many as there are terrestrial plants, right? And they have, they have expanded to fill every niche out there. They grow in thermal hot springs. They grow in desert crust. They grow on, on ice sheets in Antarctica. They grow at, at 18,000 feet elevation with UV that would kill any other plant. Those traits, those genes can be mined from algae and put into to other systems. Right? 